we are delighted to be with you, and we encourage you to tune in every Saturday from 6.30 until 7 p.m. Central Time, 7.30 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time for the All Things Fulfilled broadcast. And we encourage you also to visit our website at allthingsfulfilled.com. In addition, we encourage you to visit our YouTube channel. We um, want to also mention that we have a debate, an eschatology debate coming up on the 12th of January. That debate is going to be held on the Standing for Truth broadcast, which is also a YouTube channel with uh, Dunny Burdinsky or Budinsky, and we want to um, I encourage you to attend that debate. It will be between Scott Clem and myself. He is a, uh, a pastor, and uh, he's going to be affirming that the resurrection is yet future, and I will be affirming that the resurrection is past and uh, denying his proposition. So we're looking forward to that, and uh, it's going to be a great time. I think it's going to air around 6 or 7 p.m., so just go there and check for it, and you can also uh, sign up to be notified when uh, it will come. I also have a notification on the website at allthingsfulfilled.com. Now, um, we also want to mention that we have a uh, website, and I have uh, an offer of a sale pack, which is three of our books that you can get. They're normally $15 each but you can get them for $10 each, and um, that's a bundle, so be sure and look for the sale bundle there. But uh, we have uh, Living in Eternity, which is has been a popular book. Of course, this one, Will Planet Earth Be Destroyed, is um, uh, very well received by many. And then we have this book on the 23rd Psalm, The Good Shepherd in the Temple of God, uh, as an inspirational book, but also shows you from the perspective of fulfilled Bible prophecy, how the psalm just comes to light when you put it in that perspective. Uh, so you can get all three of those at one single price, uh, discounted price, and it'll save you $15 on the order. Uh, we encourage you to take advantage of that uh, if you want those uh, on sale. Now, um, today we're going to continue on the topic that we began on last week, and so we'll uh, do our best to wrap it up for today. We were talking about Christ coming in glory and therefore coming in the glory of his kingdom. And so we're going to be uh, focused on that for uh, the next few minutes. Last week, we were looking at a couple of passages, and I'll just quickly touch on those uh, very quickly so that you can see, you know, you go back to the first video if you want to watch the charts in uh, what we discussed there. But I'll just touch these passages. When you look in... Um, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 21, you will see where the Bible says, grant that these two, my sons, sit the one on your right and the one on your left in your uh, kingdom. And then when you look at Mark's um, uh, passage on that, in Mark 10, verse 37, he'll say, grant that these, my two sons, sit the one on your right and on your left in your glory. So we were showing that the glory and the coming of the kingdom are one and the same. And the reason we were talking about that was because of the pushback and the objection we get on Matthew chapter 16, verses 27 and 28, where the text says, for the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, and then he will reward each according to his work. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death, who will not die, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, one of the objections that we get to that is that we are dealing with the transfiguration because the scripture says, and after six days or after eight days, depending on which gospel you're looking at, uh, Jesus went up into the Mount of Transfiguration and they saw a vision of the power and the coming of the Lord. Some have said, well, that's what Matthew 16, 27 and 28 are talking about. And the reason they say that is because they are trying to get around the fact that the Bible teaches that the kingdom of God would come and Christ return, his parousia, his what we call the second coming, would occur before some of those who stood in his presence died. And that is the import of the text. And I mean, that just really, really uh, just raises the hair on the heads of those who are still looking for a future return of Christ. 
it um, angers them. Uh, they want to criticize it, ridicule it, uh, abuse it, and everything else because they can't deal with the text as it is written. So they try to make up things about it and um, uh, come up with you know these various um, uh, twisted interpretations. And I don't mean to be unkind, but that's what they are because they can't read the text as it is written and let it say what it says as it is written and therefore teach a very simple truth that the Son of Man was about to come in the glory of his Father to reward each one according to his works. Now, what we did was we showed, number one, from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, where the Bible shows that the glory of Christ comes after his death, burial, and resurrection, not at the time of the Mount of Transfiguration, which was nothing but a vision of the glory. In uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, it says, Who by him do believe in God, who... Uh, gave a uh, raising from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and your hope might be in God. So we pointed out that text. And then we went to John chapter 12 to show that the time that Jesus would be glorified was not at the Mount of Transfiguration, but it was after he was raised from the dead. And not only did we point that out, but we also pointed out that that same text, John chapter 12, starting in verse 23, is a parallel text to Matthew 16, verses 24 through 28. So again, go back to the previous uh, video and uh, watch that. Watch that uh, previous lesson so that you will see. And uh, if you haven't watched it, go to these passages and read them for yourself so that uh, you will be able to see that difference. Now, uh, what we were doing uh, as we closed the previous study was we were in Matthew chapter, uh, uh, chapter no, we were in Mark chapter 10, and we were pointing out the correlations between John 12, between Matthew 16, 27, and 28, and um, between those passages that we have there. So let's go back, and we're going to take another look at that so that we can see precisely what is going on with those uh, particular passages. So we're going to share our screen so that you can see the actual uh, charts that we used, and uh, we'll uh, take it from there. So here's the one that shows Matthew 20, 21, uh, grant that these, my two sons, may sit the one on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. And verse 37 of Mark 10 says, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory, showing that kingdom and glory are used uh, for the same thing to talk about the coming of the Lord, the coming of the kingdom. Yet we have those who say the kingdom is not present, but the Bible tells us when it would be present, it would be before some of those who stood in Jesus' presence when he was on earth before all of them died. Now, the next thing that we did, as we said, is we showed from uh, this chart that the idea of coming in his glory and coming in his kingdom were synonymous in terms of uh, the parousia of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. And so notice in this text, I'll say it once more, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So Jesus didn't say that they would not taste death till they saw the transfiguration. He said they would not taste death till they saw the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, let's look at uh, Mark 10, 28. We touched on that, so I'm going to uh, do a quick uh, sort of uh, drive-by on that one as well. Uh, no, won't be any shooting any uh, real live bullets, but we will be shooting the Word of God. The Bible says, Then Peter began to say to him, See, we have left all and followed you. So Jesus answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. So this period of persecutions and receiving these blessings take place in what is called the um, 
that particular time, who shall not receive now in this time. Now, we're going to talk about uh, this time in some of these passages so that you understand a little bit uh, better what that's all about. We'll highlight it there so you can uh, so you can see it and see that it stands out. And we also pointed out that the persecutions began for the church as a whole with the with Saul when he was breathing out slaughter against the church and um, persecuted them. And the Bible says they went forth everywhere and scattered, you know, were scattered abroad and went forth everywhere preaching the word. That's Acts chapter eight and verse one. So the persecutions began from that point. Now, um, what we wanted to also show you was when Peter talks about this, he says, in this time uh, with the persecutions and in the age to come. So the age to come is actually the age in which the glory and the kingdom would come. This is very, very important in terms of the glory of Christ. That would come in the age to come, not in that present time. So he says, um, from the perspective of the glory, they would receive a hundredfold now in this time, what? Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. And in the age to come, the life of the age. So the life of the age, what we call eternal life, is that which is given in the age to come. Now, let's examine Luke's gospel. In Luke chapter 18, verse 28, to show you how all these passages are parallel, the text says, Then Peter said, See, we have left all and followed you. So he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the, notice, kingdom of God, who shall not receive many times more when? In this present time and in the age to come, eternal life. So notice, he said, in this present time and in the age to come, eternal life. So when he says this time in verse um, uh, 30 of Mark chapter 10, he says this present time in verse 29 of Luke chapter 18. So these have to be understood as the same time. And so we're just going to go ahead and highlight that as well so that you can uh, see it. And then what stands over against that is the age to come. I hope you can see that, uh, that text uh, clearly there. But he says, in that time, they were going to receive the houses, et cetera, as he mentioned before. But in the age to come, they would receive eternal life. Now, that's the age of resurrection. Because resurrection happens in the age to come, according to Luke chapter 20, verses 35 and 36. So this is the time of the resurrection. No one can say that the resurrection occurred at the time of the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, we shouldn't even be countenancing such a thought as that, other than the fact that there was a vision of the parousia. Now, he says, in this present time. Now, we're going to talk about that present time a little bit, but let's look at another text. Now, notice he says, uh, for the sake of the kingdom. Now, if it's for the sake of the kingdom, it would likewise be for the sake of the glory, because the kingdom and the glory would be one and the same in these eschatological texts. But now let's go to another passage in Matthew uh, and notice now, we've looked at Matthew 16, 27, and 28, and we've seen how there's an interchange in the use of both kingdom and glory. But let's look at Matthew 19, verses 28 through 29. So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory. Now, when is it that Jesus would sit on the throne of his glory? It would be in the regeneration. And the Bible says, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory. So the throne is just another name for the kingdom, in the because the throne is in the kingdom. So when he sits on the throne, which is in the kingdom of his glory. So we're talking about the kingdom of his glory. Now watch what he says. You who have followed me, 
will also sit on 12 thrones. Now, why are they sitting on 12 thrones? Because they would be raised up to sit on those thrones doing what? Judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And he says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my namesake shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. So you can see that we're dealing with the same context that we've been talking about before. And now Jesus just adds a statement, assuredly I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, here's the uh, passage in Matthew 25 and verse 31. So let's take a look at this text. The scripture says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory. Now, is that the Mount of Transfiguration? I don't think so. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him. Now, remember, that's the same coming in glory that we find in Matthew 16, 27, and 28, where he says, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. But now it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Well, isn't that the same throne of glory in Matthew chapter 19, verses 28 and 29, as you can see right on the screen? He says, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. And of course, this is the time of judgment when he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. That's Matthew 25, 31 and following. So at the end of that uh, context, verse 46 he says, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, or actually, he's saying that they will go into an everlasting cutting off, meaning that they would be cut off from the covenant. This is Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, when Jesus, speaking about the uh, Gentiles coming into the kingdom, says, Many will come from the east and the west, and Luke's gospel adds, and the north and the south, and will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But you, speaking to those Jews who were in the presence of Christ, when you yourselves shall be cast out into the outer darkness, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, that was 70 AD when those Jews were cast out. So, that's when they would sit on the throne uh, of his glory, when they would be raised up. But that's when the Son of Man would come in his glory as well. And therefore, uh, these will go away into everlasting uh, cutting off. It's the word that is used for pruning. And therefore, they would be cut off from the covenant and no longer be the people of God. Yes, there was God's wrath that was involved, which we read about in Matthew 3 and uh, Matthew 23 in uh, First um, Thessalonians 2, 14 through 16, the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. And again, those were the ones who crucified the Lord and who persecuted the saints and who killed the prophets. And again, in Revelation chapter 18, verses 20 and 24, Revelation 19, 2, where the wrath of God was meted out on the great harlot city. But that's what's being spoken of in that particular text. And it says, uh, but the righteous into life eternal. Now, as we've looked at this, notice that all of this would take place after what the Bible calls that present time. So let's take a look as well at some verses that talk about the present time and see if the present time is limited to the time of the Mount, Trans of, uh, Mount of Transfiguration or if it involved the entire time up to the arrival of the age to come. So let's examine some of those passages. In the um, 18th chapter of Romans, Romans chapter 8 and the verse is 18. The text says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time. Now the root word there is the word histomy, which means to stand in, to be present. 
that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which is about to be revealed in us. Well, the word mellow is used, and he's talking about the glory that was about to be revealed, meaning that this was not revealed, meaning fulfilled, unveiled at the time of the Mount of Transfiguration. As a matter of fact, I believe the scripture even talks about that unveiling uh, in 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's see uh, if that's what I'm thinking. Uh, in 1 Peter 5, verse 1, he, the text says, The elders who are among you I exhort. I who am also, or who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that is about to be revealed, that was about to be manifested. Here is Peter writing many, many years after the Mount of Transfiguration, saying that the glory of Christ was about to be revealed. And that's the same thing Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which is about to be revealed in us. And that is the glory that comes or that Jesus comes in in terms of the coming or the arrival of the kingdom. That's an eschatological glory that's being spoken of there. Then in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 22, we have the text where Paul is talking about all things have been given to believers, given to Christians. And he says, whether, they, whether it's Paul or Apollos, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or things present. There's the same word that's being used. Or things to come. Notice how things present stand over the things to come. He says, all are yours. And uh, you belong to Christ, Christ belong to God, etc. So he's telling you that this present time is the time of, that goes all the way up to the coming of the Lord in glory, meaning the things to come. Now, look again in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 26. Paul talked about the persecutions. Remember the saints were to uh, be involved in persecution prior to the uh, receiving of the life that was in the age to come. So here's what Paul said in verse 26. I suppose, therefore that this is good because of the present distress. Well, the word present there is the same word that's used in those other passages that we've already looked at. So they were going through this tribulation. They were going through these persecutions. They were going through these trials at that present time uh, after, many years after, the Mount of Transfiguration. But those were the things that they had to go through in order for them to arrive at the glory of Christ. Again, he says that it is good because of the present distress that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Now, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4, Paul talked about the age. Remember, we spoke in the previous lesson from 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 when Paul said, Now, all of these things uh, happen to us as examples or types, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So Paul was saying that the end of the ages would come on their generation. They would see the end of the age. However, they were living in that age where the rulers of that age had crucified the Lord of glory. Now, from that perspective, we should see that that's the age where those rulers who crucified Christ live. That's not our generation. That's not our time. That was in the first century. But notice what we have in Galatians 1.4. The text says, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. He's talking about those in the first century, saying that they would be delivered from that present evil age. That age is not still with us today. We're not in that age. That was the age that came to its end in the time of the apostles. He says, according to the will of God and our Father. That's what the present evil age was. People try to make today the present evil age, and it doesn't work. Then he says, now, brethren, concerning the coming, this is 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2, the parousia of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, 
So this gathering was already taking place in the first century. We ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come, literally was present. It's the same word used in all the other passages. Some translated as present, some translated as had come, but it means that it had already arrived. And of course, when you study Second Thessalonians, you will see that the, some of them believed that Jesus' coming had already occurred in their lifetime. But again, that's after the Mount of Transfiguration. So they weren't expecting the glory at the time of the Mount of Transfiguration. They knew that it would come later after Jesus had risen from the dead. Then in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 1, he says, But I know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. That word is the same word. So he's actually saying, in the last days, perilous times will be present. And we've already seen they were undergoing the present distress. And Paul talked about the sufferings of this present time. Now, what aids do those belong to? Hebrews 9 and verse 9 tells us very clearly. And if you look at the uh, original in the Greek, it will say it is symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Now, after 70 AD, there was no more offering of these animal sacrifices. As a matter of fact, the Jews came up with a whole different style of worship because they could no longer offer any sacrifices, no more priests, no more genealogy, no more temple. It was all gone. But he says the present time. So the present time was the time under the law. And unless we're still in the old age of the old covenant with the old sacrifices, we do not live in that age, but we are in the age to come. So ladies and gentlemen, that is the, uh, the meaning of this uh, term. And that is what the text is telling us in terms of the fulfillment of these things. And since those things have been fulfilled, we should understand that we are not to see them as happening in our day and time because those things uh, have been fulfilled. Well, that's all the time that we have. And I'm William Bell. I look forward to being back with you again in our next study. So stay tuned. Have a safe holiday season and a happy new year. Mm -hmm.